So thank you all for uh, for joining us. A little bit of a, of a tech uh, tech issue here, but you know, as always with uh, live VMAs, it's always a little bit a little bit tricky. But Jay and I and uh, Wes were super excited to uh, kind of share with you a bunch of different things. Um, some things I guess we already let the cat out of the out, out of the bag, but you know we're going to be uh, Jay's going to be doing a, a demo of some really groundbreaking uh, research. Um, around the AI model uh, for the good part of last year. So we'll, we'll get to that in about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but um, before that, you know, we have uh, a few questions that the uh, community has prepared uh, over the last few days, and we wanted to run through those. Um, so maybe we can, um, you know, we can, uh, we can get started. And as soon as uh, Wes, uh, Wes's situation is resolved, he can join us. So the first question that, that we got from community member uh, is, you know, what part uh, will the Theta token play in the future of Edge Cloud? How will Theta Labs look to reward users for securing the network, uh, including the new uh, Edge Cloud service? Um, yeah, so just a quick recap for everyone. As, as you know, TFuel has been the, primarily, the primary utility and the gas token for the Theta um, network and the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, when we launched uh, our uh, native chain um, back in 2019, uh, you know, we had uh, the main Theta token, which is the staking governance token. Uh, so, of course, by staking Theta, you uh, earn TFO. Now, Edge Cloud, uh, as you know, uh, we launched last week, uh, is powered by, of course, uh, by TFO. And with the June 26 release that's coming up, um, with the Elite Boosters, uh, it's really an opportunity to take sort of that uh, TFO utility uh, and participating in the broader um, ecosystem for Edge Cloud that's really fueled by TFL, no pun intended. Uh, and I think that's really um, a, a big basis for, um, you know, for the Theta and TFL. Now, with TFL utility increasing, uh, primarily around AI use cases, but also video pipeline uh, use cases, rendering, uh, gaming in the future, you know, we see TFL's utility token, you know, becoming much more popular and widespread, which in turn, of course, uh, should fuel, again, no pun intended, you know, the primary uh, Theta token. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I uh, also uh, would like to add that uh, some of you guys might have noticed that uh, for Edge Cloud, right, so uh, so we have multiple payment methods uh, supported. So currently, uh, users, the customer can pay through USD, but in the future, they're going to add payments through TFU, right? So it's going to come, which will increase the utility of TFU on the Edge Cloud platform. Perfect. Uh, do we have Wes back, or is, is are we still working on, uh, on the on Wes? Got it. So, <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep uh, moving forward. Um, so the next uh, the next set of um, questions that we got from the community uh, are mobile Edge nodes uh, coming soon and more information for smartphones and smart TVs. Uh, so this is, I think, it's a really great question. Um, as you know, we did announce a few weeks ago uh, in a blog post uh, that we are working on the um, Android um, uh, version of the uh, Edge node. Um, really happy to, and I'm gonna get in trouble. Again, we do this every single time. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be speaking for, uh, for Ryan or, uh, you know, and our developers. That um, the uh, that it should be launched in the next few weeks. So we're super excited. Uh, of course, that's going to be available on the Google Play Store. You can be able to download it. Uh, and uh, and what's more interesting is that uh, the initial use case uh, that we identified is uh, really exciting. It's really utilizing uh, AI object detection for uh, and you know for for video clips. So so imagine um, you know one of our um, one, of, one of our partners, you know, has a very large user-generated uh, platform where, you know, uh, people submit thousands of uh, videos a day. So being able to run that through um, this um, uh, AI model where you can essentially detect that, look, you know, this five-minute clip is about, you know, a dog on a beach, you know, very, versus that two-minute clip, clip is about my parrot, you know, talking in Spanish. Uh, or something like that. Um, and so the whole concept of object detection and understanding sort of the context of a video clip uh, is something that we're going to be want launching with. Uh, and it's going to be running, it's going to be running under sort of calibration mode or test mode. So we want to be cautious, uh, at least initial stage, um, that uh, we're really testing sort of the infrastructure and sort of the capabilities of the mobile device 
right, and the CPU and G GPU capabilities. Um, but you know, I think the, the, the important uh, point about this particular use case is that it really enables what we call sort of this ability to parallel process, which is really an ideal use case um, for a distributed network of, of nodes, right? Particularly mobile devices, right? With you know, tens, hundreds of millions, actually billions of devices around the world. Really the ability to take, look, if you have a five minute video clip, you can slice that into a hundred pieces of five seconds uh, each, and that can be essentially processed and then uh, that can be brought back and assimilated into sort of you know, one uh, end result, right? That essentially determines what the, uh, what the content uh, of that is. So we're super exciting. So that's, that's coming up uh, soon in the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, super excited about that. Uh, and then looking forward to the future, right? So um, I see people, especially the, the cell phone manufacturers, they are uh, talking about throwing even more powerful hardware, right? Uh, chips onto their cell phone in the future. For example, they may have, you know, some AI specific uh, ASIC, right? So ASIC chips into the cell phone and then you, you can, as you can imagine, that they will open the door to even more potential uh, edge cloud computing opportunities, right? So your cell phone will be able to process, you know, even uh, more complex tasks than which will enable our edge cloud to be able to rip those um, resources and more efficiently. Perfect. So hey, uh, testing, testing, you got me back now? We, we can hear you, Wes. Yeah. This is for Kyle to, to test if it's on the stream, but it you can keep going. All right, we'll keep going. And the question yes, is, Wes. Mm -hmm. yeah, the question is uh, whether the community can hear you, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep so going. Exciting. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going. And then, uh, you know, as soon as community, uh, you know, you guys can put in chat whether you can hear Wes or not. Right. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> But uh, let's 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 keep moving. Um, so it's the next uh, the next question that uh, submitted by the community. Um, you know, what is there anything significant about the June twenty sixth date of our uh, booster launch? Uh, every other launch has been in the first of the month. Was was there a particular reason for this date? And, and and the short answer is no, not really. I mean, it was really driven by Jay. You can talk a bit about sort of development cycle and uh, the fact that we wanted to. To launch um, the Edge Cloud, the developer interface, uh, you know, earlier, right, as we did on May first, uh, with the booster coming up at the end of June. You know, one nice thing about the end of June is the fact that um, it's also the end of the quarter. So for those of you that that will be participating in the three, six, twelve month lock, it kind of ends at each of the quarters, right, end of September and December and so on and so forth. Um, so um, so that's the key, uh, the key driver there. Yeah, so uh, June 26 is Wednesday, right? Middle of the week, so we can have all hands on deck, right? Uh, you know, working towards this uh, release. Yeah, it is a little bit uh, r risky. There's a lot of moving parts, right? right? It's right. highly yeah. complex software Jay and the team's working on. Yeah. Uh, also, in the U.S., um, the week after is a 4th of July weekend uh, and week, and, and uh, some people are taking some time off, so we just want to allocate, make sure that uh, everything goes smoothly. Um, so, um, yeah, so moving on, um, a related question. Uh, is uh, more clarity on the booster rewards, right, for June 26th. In particular, um, the, um, the three-month lock, uh, the amount that can be earned, uh, as well as, um, you know, the, the six and the 12 months. So, um, again, just, just to re recap, I, I know we've, we've put out a couple FAQs, uh, but um, <clears throat> sometimes it's good to kind of, uh, for us to, uh, to review sort of the, the overall um, they were all pieces, right, for, for the 26 launch. So first of all, um, to become a lead booster node, you have to uh, stake uh, a full 500,000 TFO from a single dedicated wallet, right? Uh, so that's sort of the first, uh, the first requirement at that point. Uh, when you go to the, uh, uh, the elite node uh, or your edge node uh, UI, you'll see a new interface that will enable you to see the edge cloud. Um, from there, you can lock uh, an additional 500,000 TFO across the three month, six month, the 12 month option, right? Uh, and it could be any combination, it could be 200, 200, 100, or 400, 100, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that essentially enables you to earn a share, a proportional share of all of the, uh, the Edge Cloud uh, rewards from all the jobs that's being processed uh, in our um, uh, cloud based. Uh, AI GPUs, um, and then uh, if you were to uh, uh, if you were to unstake uh, a portion of that initial five hundred thousand TFO, uh, then you, you'll become essentially disqualified. You, you'll no longer be earning 
uh, the the Edge Cloud um, booster rewards. Uh, so uh, of course we encourage you to to keep that uh, keep that staked. Uh, and uh, our target earnings, as, as as you can imagine, the earnings for the TFL locked should be higher than the base uh, TFL staking rewards, which is currently around seven percent. Uh, it should be higher than seven percent. Um, uh, but that depends in terms of how much higher, whether it's like a 15% or 30%, that really depends on the amount of GPU that's utilized, a percent of the GPU that's utilized uh, in the cloud. Um, but as we as we get going, um, you'll be able to quickly see sort of your pending earnings, uh, which will show uh, in the um, in the dashboard, uh, in your edge node, uh, and they'll be paid out uh, once per month. So similar to the current edge node jobs, it will be paid out at the end of each month, uh, but you'll be able to see uh, your year or your month to date. Um, rewards there. Um, yeah. Did I miss anything? Oh uh, yeah, I, I think it's just uh, uh, also I think what I'd like to mention that the, the reward right it could come in different forms. Uh, it uh, could yes. be TFU token and mm -hmm. could be other TNT twin tokens, right? Correct. Same combination. So it's going to be a combination of uh, TFU as well as uh, uh, par partner tokens, right? That's utilizing you know the uh, Edge Cloud for certain types of jobs. You know, primarily AI rendering types of jobs. So in aggregate, um, those returns um, will 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 be uh, should be higher again should be higher than the base staking of seven percent. Okay, great. Yeah, cool. Cool. Um, is uh, Wes uh, back Sorry. with us? <laughs> back right. for real this time. Chat can okay. hear me. So thanks okay. back at okay. HQ for figuring out whatever that <laughs> issue was. Um, and yeah, happy to be here for since you missed the original intro said. Uh, happy to be live from Amsterdam. It's late night here, but excited to talk to the data community. So uh, glad we could finally connect here. Uh, yeah, so I'll jump in. There's one from the from Twitter that I thought was interesting. Um, to, uh, an important one to clarify too about whether uh, for Edge Cloud clients are they paying Theta Labs directly to distribute the Edge Cloud nodes, or the clients paying directly to the nodes for taking on jobs? Basically, how does all that all work? Um, and if it's in USD, or, or is it possible to use USD to utilize the services? So uh, short answer is for now, uh, clients will just transfer in the V1 transfer to the labs who distributes it over the edge nodes. Um, you know, the, the, the eventual vision is that the, through a, a dashboard uh, and, and set of smart contracts possibly, uh, you'll just upload what you're gonna be uh, whatever crypto that you're going to be using to pay the nodes, and it can be transferred directly. Um, there still will be the option, I imagine, through either Theta Labs or a third-party payment provider. Uh, if you want to use USD and have that converted to crypto, uh, whether it's TFUEL or, or, or the TNT20 token, to pay Edge Cloud uh, nodes in the future, because there will be a lot of clients, no doubt. You know, some are going to be crypto native and happy to pay in TFUEL or um, you know, Levita Replay may be wanting to pay in their own native currency to edge out operators. Um, but some are going to be big clients. Uh, I, I would assume that um, one just paying dollars. Either we can convert it or just like you see today where there's MoonPay and all these other payment processors that quickly make it easy to pay in dollars, convert to crypto. Very same will be for edge nodes as well. Great. Uh, excellent. Um... You know, I, I did. I did see a question maybe before uh, we we go to the next area, right before Jay's demo. I'm super excited, right, uh, to to show you guys. Jay will get into some pretty pretty crazy stuff. Uh, ho hopefully, you you enjoy that. There was a question in Data Drop chat um, whether uh, I want to know if AWS is involved at all. So, uh, you know, so one, once again, I. Um, you know, we, we, you know, in my past AMAs always talk about there's a lot of partners that we work with. Uh, I can absolutely tell you that AWS is one of the partners that we are uh, actively working with, but we can't announce anything uh, just yet. And as, as you guys know, we don't, we don't like to pre-announce things. So um, when we're ready for that, we'll, you'll, you'll definitely be the first to know. Um, I, know I, do, I do know that some of our um, other partners out there may have said uh, or shared a, a few things, and that's okay. Uh, but um, yeah, but we're, we're super, super excited. Uh, and as you can imagine, there's really three primary uh, cloud uh, leaders in the space. So um, I can definitely say that we are uh, excited to, uh, to be working with all three. So uh, with that, Jay, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a good, good uh, uh, segue to transition to some of the kind of technical related questions, right? So I, I saw one on Twitter. So 
what is the main difference between traditional AI data centers and edge cloud AI processors, right? Uh, can they perform the same computation on them both? So yeah, I'll say that uh, on say the edge cloud, so we have this unbeatable uh, price to uh, performance to price ratio, right? So because we incorporate not just uh, the GPUs in the cloud or data centers, but also a bunch of uh, GPUs from you guys, right? The community, right? So that can help uh, us to reduce operate operation costs, so we can offer our services at a lower price point compared to traditional cloud vendors, right? So that's the first thing. The second is that uh, I want to emphasize that the Edge Cloud is not just a, a bunch of cluster of GPUs, but we build uh, a, a stack of middleware software, right? And then UI UX for developers. So make it uh, developer friendly. Uh, if you can, if you guys have uh, some of the developer uh, in, in the community might know that if you want to actually run a, let's say large language model or a uh, stable diffusion in the cloud, then you have to first go in and then you know start a VM or a cluster or something and do a bunch of uh, things, right? It take it could take you a day to set the environment up and then uh, to to get you the uh, inference endpoint to start integrate into your your app. Uh, but in Edge Cloud, because we have this uh, simple UI, a developer can just do a few clicks on on the UI and then boom, he has these uh, the, the inference endpoint which is ready to be in, in, incorporated into uh, the application, right? So this simplify the UI UX and then really boost the efficiency for the developers. Right? So those are the main two differences. So uh, so yeah, so come to use our Edge Cloud, So which will be, uh, I think we'll be delighted to see its features. Yeah, and, and if I can add a little, just a little bit to the price performance, uh, which which as you guys know is, is on the homepage of our Edge Cloud dashboard. Uh, and I think that's a really important one for us to emphasize and that's really sort of our vision for the future of um, the decentralized hybrid, right, um, uh, cloud and distributed uh, system that we're building uh, is the fact that, you know, as part of this middleware that Jay described as part of this uh, software layer that we're adding is the ability to really route certain types of AI jobs or even some subcomponents, sub pieces of an AI job, having that intelligence coming in and be able to then route that to the best uh, price to performance GPU, right? And that could, for instance, you know, earlier, I uh, described uh, the mobile Android use case being, you know, specifically around video and object uh, detection, uh, scene detection. Um, that's the type of thing that uh, we think works extremely well in distributed nodes like a, a mobile GPU and, and the potentially, uh, you know, other devices like smart TVs where um, it's, it's fairly low um, uh, requirement in terms of uh, computation. Uh, and so in that case, you know, why would you necessarily want to run that on a, an expensive A100, uh, uh, you know, GPU? Um, it just doesn't make sense, right? Where you have potentially these tens of thousands of nodes that can, uh, that can do that much more uh, efficiently and much, much more, uh, much, uh, much cheaper. So, um, so that's sort of a, a key piece um, yeah. to the uh, price performance. You know, the other, uh, the other thing I just read on Twitter, just, just before we started EMA, I know we have a community member that does a, a great tracking of our uh, uh, some of our stats across our network, um, and uh, we saw that the number of elite nodes in our network have surpassed 10,000 in the last few days, which is a huge accomplishment. I think we've been working towards that for for quite a while, uh, and uh, that's been steadily increasing, which is just amazing to see. And the fact that the TFL staking unlocked is now approaching 40%. I think we're just a little bit shy of that. We're at 39 point some percent. We would we, we would love to see that uh, approach 50, 60 percent plus uh, over the next few months or over the next uh, next year, uh, and that's really um, uh, re really amazing. So I think we're making tremendous progress there, and we still got a uh, about uh, what is it about a month and a half before the June 26 launch of of uh, the booster, uh, which incidentally, if you go to our homepage, you know we did add a. Uh, a, a, a countdown clock, you know, to the booster launch. So that's that's going to be a next major um, major initiative for us. So very exciting there. So with that, JE, are oh, you ready? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think talking about technology, right? Tech, talking about the uh, uh, the intermediate middleware and 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 software we're building. So it's a good good time to to switch to our um, demo today. So we'd like to unveil uh, this groundbreaking sketch to three D Gen AI technology we've been working on, has down working on in the past few months. Right? Uh, so yeah, so let me switch to my desktop. Okay, so uh, yeah, you guys can see my uh, slides, right? Going up. 
Okay, okay. So yeah, let, let's go. Yeah, go for it. So this is a um, a sketch to three D Gen AI technology, uh, and then what is main purpose? Right, the goal is to turn a two D hand drawn sketch right into three D model. Right, uh, and then uh, what what are applications? Uh, a lot of you, I think you probably have already have uh, this application ideas in mind, but I would like to emphasize that uh, in areas like animation, gaming, movie architecture and industrial design right there's a bunch of uh, different use cases for example in gaming in the early design for for games that the 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 artist right has to come up with all the characters and all the scenes right and then they want to visualize those in the 3d environment but uh, right with without this uh, automated tools they have to work with uh, 3d designers to in, in in iteration to to come up with this this uh, 3d models and environments so this, for on, uh, firstly, it, it requires the 3D designer to be highly versatile in very, various types of tools. And also, this is very uh, labor intensive, so it could take days right, to turn around. So the entire iteration becomes really, really long, right? really, really slow. So uh, we would like to build a new technology which can turn this uh, 2D hand drawing automatically into 3D, right? So what are the challenges there? So we first, we want, want it to be fast, right? Super fast, much faster than the traditional workflow. So maybe it takes only one minute, you know, 30 seconds to, to turn around so that it will, we will kind of speed up, right? The, uh, the, 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 the working process in, tremendously. But the second uh, challenge is, is uh, uh, related to the, the, the quality of the outcome. So we do want to preserve the subtle details and the shape envisioned by the artist in the 2D sketch, right? We want the detail to be present in the final 3D, right? So that's posed another major challenge to this technolo technology. So in order to address like, uh, this, this problem, so we have uh, developed a unique 3D generated technology. So follow uh, the, the, the model pipeline concept, right? We, we have been, you know, uh, talked about in our blog post since last year. Uh, so uh, here I have a, uh, a diagram showing this um, pipeline. So it has two stages, right? The first stage, it, it leverages a uh, stable diffusion and also uh, control net. Those are technologies that, you know, just come up uh, uh, in the literature in, in last year, in a few, few months ago. So this first stage will take uh, the sketch from the user as input. In addition, it optionally take a text prompt right, as input. So through the text prompt, you can describe uh, the sketch in a little bit more detail, right? And then maybe you will you can tell that you know a uh, certain uh, uh, aspect of the model you want it looks like animation style or like realistic style and all that, right? So all this will be uh, taken as input and 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 fed into the first stage model. As you can see, there's a very complicated multi-stage, uh, multi-layer uh, um, uh, neural, neural uh, network here, right? So uh, after a few rounds of processing, so it, it uh, turns out uh, generate a 2.5D images, right? Which is this 3D image uh, pro projected on a 2D plane. So after that, so once we have this image, then we need to leverage some of the very advanced uh, algorithm to extract the primary object from this generated 2D image. Right, and then and reduce the background noises, right? So, uh, and after that, once we have the major object, then we leverage the so-called LRM model, so which has come out of uh, Adobe and Stability AI, right? Uh, as you can see, there's multiple, multiple stages of processing, and then after a bunch of computation, you finally come out with the 3D model here, right? So which can be uh, inputted into some 3D modeling tool so that for the designer and the game developers, right, to visualize and then to determine what to do next. So this is the kind of high level overview of the, this technology. Uh, then uh, maybe without further ado, maybe we can go into the demo itself. Sure. Oh, or maybe if you want to add a few things here. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think um, w one of the interesting aspects here, uh, JE is being, um, I, I think, very uh, conservative here uh, in, in the words, but I, this is really groundbreaking technology. I think what's really unique here and this is uh, many, many, many years of, of effort, right, with the engineering team, um, is developing this concept of a model pipeline. Um, and if you, if you really look at sort of, you know, real, real world use cases, for instance, you know, large animation, big budget films, you know, coming out of Hollywood, um, where you're trying to essentially create these 3D environments and, and, uh, and characters, it is extremely expensive, not just because of the technology involved in, the, in terms of GPU processing required, but it's also the workflow. It's the fact that you have multiple teams and multiple 
uh, groups of people, uh, right, different skill sets, right? The, 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 from the ideation phase, right? The artists that create the 2D sketches to then turning that into, you know, sort of initial 3D models, right? To visualize and then you go through that loop and that cycle, you know, um, many, many times before you then uh, move on to the next phase, which is refinement and improvement and adding the scenes, adding the background, adding the transitions, all that is extremely uh, complex. Um, and that is what we believe, um, you know, with this concept of model pipeline, which we'll be talking about more and more uh, as really a unique uh, area of research uh, that Jane and Tina have started on. And this is sort of our first uh, sort of uh, output of that um, is really to uh, use a model pipeline, AI model pipelines to essentially minimize and streamline um, the workflow involved uh, in real world use cases, right? Where there's real people involved. Uh, so this is really, really absolutely groundbreaking. Um, you know, one other application model pipeline, which I also I guess share here, uh, which again, you know, part of the engineering team might kill me, but we are going to be doing an update uh, to the AI showcase for our text image, the stable diffusion, which uh, many of you have been playing with and it's super exciting. Uh, we're going to be adding a model pipeline there as well, where we automatically will be uh, taking your prompt uh, and feeding that into the Llama 3 chatbot, uh, producing an enhanced prompt, uh, and then the associated image out of uh, the uh, stable diffusion uh, text to, uh, to, uh, to image. Uh, but the way we'll do that is that we'll actually put them side by side. So you'll be able to see your original prompt and then you'll be able to see the enhanced prompt. And so I think this is a, a really unique way for us to then let you play with it and be able to then uh, get even better at it uh, and, uh, uh, and a, a great application again of, uh, of model pipeline. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, so without further ado, so uh, let's switch to the second tab. So. Uh, here I'm showing the model explorer right on uh, Edge Cloud. So if you you have uh, uh, visited this Edge Cloud this morning, you might notice that we have added a new model, right? So which is sketch to 3D. Uh, this is uh, developed by Theta, so we have our Theta logo here. Uh, to launch it, you know, very easy. Just click on it, and then just keep the uh, default uh, option here, and then just click on uh, create the new deployment here. Um, it will uh, after the create de deployment here. It will take take a, take some time to initialize initialize this model. But uh, this morning I have already you know uh, deploy one of this model on our uh, uh, deployment dashboard. So I can you know go directly to to there and and show you uh, what it looks like. Okay. So I click on this inference endpoint here. Right? So you can as you can see on this um, in this on this UI you have this uh, left part and the right part. Right. So on the left part it allows you to either upload an image or uh, do a sketch right directly on this drawing board uh, and then on the right side here there's a couple buttons so uh, when you click through this button so we'll be able to generate a 3d model okay so now let me uh, start the first uh, demo so where uh, I actually have a um, piece of paper here uh, I'm not sure you guys can see it uh, so uh, it is a sketch of a car right so I'm getting closer it took me five hours to draw it, so uh, <laughs> lots of effort. So, okay, so uh, you're not an artist. <laughs> I'm not an artist, so 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 uh, 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 two artists probably would take just one minute, right? So, uh, hopefully. Uh, but uh, I already have I have this uh, piece of paper, and then uh, before this uh, this demo, I already took a picture and then um, and then sent it to my des desktop. So let's switch back to the the desktop UI, and then see if I can just upload the the, the photo of this uh, sketch, and then whether I can turn it into a uh, 3D model. Okay, so okay, so uh, yeah, I, I just uploaded this um, this the car sketch here, uh, and then the next step, pretty simple. Uh, I can just click on generate 2D, okay. uh, and I wait for a few seconds. Of course, this is all live uh, and it's all live, being right? processed, yeah, through right, our Edge right. Cloud servers. Yeah, yeah, it's a running Edge Cloud. So you can see that uh, now you have this two two point five D um, image here, which is showing a, a a racing car, right? But uh, let's say if I don't like this image, uh, I can actually type a prompt here to modify it, right? So people always ask, you know, when Lambo, right? So how about we generate a Lambo Lamborghini racing car here and see how it looks like.
Okay, so this is nice. maybe I, I feel it's better looking. And now, so let's try to uh, do the last one magic step to turn it into a 3D object. Okay, so I just click on generate 3D. Okay, so for those who ask when Lambo is, Lambo is here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I can, uh, you know, uh, zoom in, zoom out, right? And then see the, the, the detail of it and, it and I can rotate, right? So as you can see that, um, uh, I can't even you know look at it from the the back right from uh, from the top and all that right so it shows uh, the car from different angle. I will admit that you know uh, in the current shape of form the res resolution is below right so uh, there's a lot of details not translated into this 3D object. But uh, you know two years ago people say the same for uh, stable diffusion and um, and uh, mid journey right and you, you as you know in the past two years so that few rapidly advancing and then so today it has be able to produce really high resolution 2d images then you can envision like one year from now two years from now so how this uh, you know what this can be right? so it would be a really uh, useful tool yeah it looks it looks very simple um and, it, and you guys saw in real time here that the generation of the 2.5d image and the corresponding 3d was uh, just a, a second or two um but behind the scenes, uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on, right? Uh, yeah, a lot of yeah. a lot of processing neural networks and AI model that's being run. The inference points, um, and you know, I think this 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 example here is really groundbreaking. It's really stunning. Um, the fact that this could really, uh, at the very least, um, really impact the early stages of ideation and content creation. Um, you know, modeling, animation, right? Uh, as I mentioned, within the media entertainment space, uh, within the gaming space, right? Anytime you're developing uh, a, a game and a particular scene or characters, be able to draw that out and be able to visualize that, you know, within a few minutes is incredible. Right. Uh, this alone could, you know, shortcut uh, the game initial uh, design phases by, you know, uh, X uh, factors. And it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in addition, if you you're an artist, then yeah, you, you might not just want to watch, you know, uh, do this uh, rotation inside this web interface. So, uh, but we have this uh, feature that where you can click here and download actually download the 3D model onto your desktop. Right? So after that, you can import it into some 3D modeling tools, right, to refine it, right, to look at how it looks like and place in the scene, right, so that uh, to to integrate it into your workflow, right. So that's, that's uh, one feature I want to show here. Or just as easily be able to then uh, import that model right into your Unity, right? right Unity, Unreal environment or Unreal, Adobe, right. Unreal and, right. and be able to then uh, place that within your game scene. Uh, so, uh, you know, very, again, very, very, uh, very quickly there. Yeah. So, okay. So this is the first demo. So uh, let me do the second demo. So, yeah, some people might say that, hey, I, I, I don't want to do a sketch, right? It took some too much time. So uh, what should I do? So. Uh, yeah, so let me show you this. So this is just one image, right? So where I did I get this image? Obviously, I'm not drawing this. I'm not, not that good. So, uh, but I used our uh, AI showcase actually to generate this Godzilla from a text. Right? So go to uh, AI showcase and just type in uh, Godzilla and you know turn the parameter, and I, I got something like this. Uh, and then here uh, I can you know um, try to see what it looks like if I uh, turn it into a 2D. Right here, right. So yes, actually turned this one into a two point five D image, which uh, looks a little bit more three D ish, right? In this image, and then uh, I can next to to click here uh, and then turn it into a three D model. Some processing time, but pretty fast. A lot going on behind the scene, right? But uh, right as you can see, right, you have the Godzilla here in three D. Wow, there it is, right? It's yeah. a little a little bit rough. Uh, yeah. But I think uh, again, this uh, this last step uh, is probably the most challenging step. There's going to be a lot lot more progress over the next six twelve months. Yeah, yeah, I I, I would uh, believe so. Uh, you can use some prompt to um, you know to help you to uh, you know ideal you know to to do some ideation work. So for example, if I want to modify this Godzilla to be a combination of Godzilla and racing car, so how it looks like, right? so. Okay, it looks something like a blend, blending <laughs> between a uh, Godzilla and a racer driver or a racing car. So, uh, and then uh, you can ob obviously uh, click once more to turn it into a, uh, 
a 3D model. So this is pretty useful because uh, sometimes when I imagine that for a game designer that sometimes you have to come up with a new character and then uh, you can obviously use your imagination to do that, but sometimes the AI can be helpful, right, to uh, help you to create something, you know, never exists before. Right? So this is uh, quite, quite interesting feature as well. Uh, and then, and then, and then, lastly. So, if you don't want to draw at all, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, prepare an image at all. What what can I do? I, I can directly type in the prompt here. Uh, for example, uh, I'll just do a uh, a fighter jet. See how it looks like. Right, so this is you know just taking from the text and then generates three D directly. So without any sketch, any drawing. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit, a bit rough here. So uh, some, uh, some distortion, but uh, yeah. So as time goes by, this become better. Uh, I, I feel that sometimes it, it may be better for if you generate something like a, a like a, a, a rectangle, rectangular shape form. For but example, but like also keep in mind that yeah. you know. These base models are not necessarily uh, trained on specific data, right? Yes, yes. So, like for instance, if if you are really in a production environment that's doing you know gaming, three D characters or you know uh, you know animals or fighter jets uh, or something like that, you would you know refine that initial model, right? So yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, for example, so I do a mansion, so which is more rectangular, and let's see how it looks like. Okay, so I think this one you know preserve the. Uh, Geometry a bit better, right? You can see the shape of form, and then let's say if you're doing a, a fantasy game or something, you might be already be able to generate all those three uh, D objects and then place it uh, into a scene you design, right? And then have a, a a feel, right? Have a sense of how it would look like. Huh? Yeah, and yeah. actually extrapolated the back of the house, right, 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 right. of this mansion, uh, which you can't see from the uh, two point five D image. Uh, and this is this is just just amazing, right? The fact yeah. Jay that you showed. Um, you know, not just uh, being able to take a hand-drawn sketch and then, you know, going through that first step of generating 2.5D image and then the 3D, but also then doing, uh, feeding in an image, right? An image which generates an image. And then lastly, text to image to 3D, text to 2.5 to 3D. So, you know, lots of, uh, lots of uh, different use cases here. Very yeah, yeah, definitely. This is also reinforce our concept of model pipeline, right? Especially in the case where <laughs> I type in text and using our AI showcase to generate image and then put image here uh, to generate 3D, right? So another, another, even another example of this AI pipeline. Right, concept. which is, again, part of our vision that Jay and I have been speaking a lot about as right. the future of Edge Cloud is really, really going really deep in sort of this workflow and AI pipeline type of concept where you could, in fact, incorporate multiple models uh, you know, you could even replace this intermediate, you know, if you don't feel that this particular model is, uh, you know, adequate or is as uh, specialized for mentions. Uh, in this case, you could replace that with another uh, AI model or checkpoint of a model where it's, you know, specialized for that. Uh, and that's really, really uh, exciting. Uh, and then how do you then make that very easy for developers through our dashboard to then, you know, perhaps even visually be able to draw boxes and draw lines, you know, input, output into these different aspects of the, uh, of the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. And uh, last note of the list, but uh, for our developer friends out there, so you can access all these features through APIs. Right? So you, you, you just go, go, go down here and click on uh, use via uh, API. So it pops up the uh, API documentation and some kind of code examples, so which allow you to actually integrate that into your own application or website. Yeah, again, this is huge, right? Being able to take these, uh, you know, endpoints and essentially the API the interfaces and be able to build a front end uh, effectively, very easy, very quickly. Uh, again, in a large organization, as you can imagine, particularly in sort of these studios and production houses, you can put together a very simple, you know, web page, you know, within inside your, your company and be able to then enable and let uh, other people uh, play with this and socialize. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I think it really, Kind of goes to you know our conversation that we've had a lot about, and I know Andrea has been out there talking a lot about the sort of concept of democratizing content and sort of enabling anyone to be able to contribute and 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 to be creative. Uh, and I think this applies not just sort of 
from a commuting standpoint, but within these large organizations as well. I mean, it could very well that be that, you know, a particular game designer or a game developer may have a better idea for, you know, a particular scene or a particular, you know, sort of uh, image uh, or object, you know, perhaps even more so than the designer, uh, the artist, uh, uh, you know, himself or herself. So that's, that's really, really exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the uh, model itself is already available on uh, our uh, model explorer today. So if you guys interested, you can jump on it and start to use it. And you know, in the coming weeks, right, we'll be working on uh, adding that to our air showcase so that uh, you guys can work uh, use it for free. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we definitely got that on the on the yeah, showcase. showcase yeah. So you guys can uh, then uh, do videos of yourselves, you know, drawing a piece of paper and yeah. scanning that into uh, you know into uh, in, into the uh, showcase. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is the uh, the demo today. Exciting. Good. Great. Yeah. All right. I All think. Right. Uh, we can jump back to some uh, of the yeah, questions. There's a question. So uh, the next question is uh, also related to Edge Cloud. Uh, is a plan that Edge Cloud will use as an infrastructure for other pla platforms or services? Yeah, I think we just talk about a lot of uh, use cases, like for example, for uh, those game developers, right? Uh, and then you can, as you can imagine, besides the example that Mitch talked about, using that as an internal tool in a uh, game studio a developer house, but uh, it, it can also be powering like chatbots, right? Uh, for some other platforms or and then uh, let's say if an artist they, they want to use a tool which has this image and video gener generative AI tools that those tools can be powered by uh, Edge Cloud right so yeah, yeah so, uh, certainly from a, a DF from an application uh, you know standpoint but also um, you know, we've been having conversations with uh, partners and um, uh, and customers where they are looking for you know very specialized uh, chatbots uh, that they can incorporate for marketing purposes, for engagement purposes, for instance, on their website. So that's another example, um, a much simpler example where you can, you know, uh, feed uh, a particular chatbot and fine tune it for specific data that's in your industry or for your particular company, uh, and then for that to be made available to uh, to your customers, your consumers. So that's again a B two B two C, right? We're providing infrastructure, right, to power uh, these specialized uh, chatbots. So these are all different examples. That we think are uh, are really opens up you know a, a bunch of different opportunities for us. Uh, and then uh, you know we had a follow on question, so we're you know going through this fairly quickly because we want to take more more questions from you live. Um, but a uh, follow on question uh, is you know how uh, how does Edge Cloud ensure uh, confidentiality and data privacy? Uh, yeah, is any text or data? Exchanges visible, or stored by the network, or nodes without uh, without encryption, and that's really a, a great question. And this goes back uh, to earlier um, uh, description uh, overview that Jay was was talking about building this uh, sort of this virtual layer or, or this middleware layer, where you know our uh, our incoming jobs, we know whether those are from particular corporate customers right where privacy and sensitivity to data is um is pretty high you know versus you know potentially open source projects or potentially you know um some text to image uh projects or to video where uh the privacy is not so so important in that case we have the ability right through the edge cloud platform to route that you know whether you know you know, as we described in the white paper, if there is a lot of sensitivity, that can be routed uh, and and, and uh, performed by GPUs in our uh, uh, cloud data centers versus uh, in our distributed network, right? Uh, eventually, in our distributed nodes that you guys are running on your PCs and and, and, and Macs and and eventually uh, Android devices, mobile devices, uh, and other types of devices in the future. Um, so. Uh, so this is a, the, the type of thing I think that we can very, very easily and very efficiently be able to manage, right, if, if there is that, uh, that concern. Cool. Yeah. Should we uh, go to a break, uh, go, go to uh, the live chat that we have yeah. on Datadrop and see if there's some questions that we want to take? Uh, yeah, let's, uh, you guys uh, start muted, adding your questions uh, if you want. Don't hear you. Am I? Uh, we mic's on. You guys can't hear me. Uh, oh yes. Uh, oh, I, I hold can. on. I'll. Uh... You can. Oh, I can hear it. Okay. You guys right, can hear you guys me, right? Continue, then. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, you guys start throwing questions in the chat, uh, and we'll also scroll up. I saw a lot of people having other questions too, so maybe we can find some good stuff to kick things off. Um, let's see. So, uh, so that's interoperable with 3D printers. That, that's quite an interesting question. I mean, maybe not out of the box, but uh, I think that would be, yeah, in the future, yeah. think about it. You could go sketch to, to model and just, you know, adjust the model as needed, change your prompts, and once you're happy with the model, one click to send it to the 3D printer. It's yeah, actually, that, that, that's an interesting idea, right? So I, I think the uh, the model we generated, the, the output format is pretty generic so that potentially it can be imported into existing tools, right? And then from there, you can do your modification and you can do your, right, uh, change the model a little bit and then put it into actual 3D, right? So we'd like to see if we can actually have something like concrete, right, from your idea to uh, something real in the in, in life. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> A lot of questions about Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, uh, well, you guys chime in if you want, but I mean, the, the shorter answer is we, uh, we, we speak with these guys we know fairly well, and we, um, if there's something we, we can announce, we will, but we don't like to, uh, step out of turn with, you know, potential partners, and you can't really say much until we're allowed to say it. So it's not really telling you a whole lot, but all this to say is we, we, Love to have something announced, and when we're allowed to say things publicly, we will. I also saw one question about, uh, you know, uh, Eli, Eli Booster on June 26th. Uh, are we going to see increased uh, jobs, right, on uh, Eli Booster? So the concept is a slight different. So because um, Eli, uh, the, the Edge Cloud currently running those containerized jobs, right, in, in, in the GPU machines, right, not necessarily uh, on, the, uh, on the user computer yet, right? In the future, we'll extend to that. Uh, so that uh, the, the 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 way we reward a user will be slightly different. So we will change the we will update the UI. So uh, then, if you download a new version of the Edge node, you will see the UI, which shows you know, for example, you know your accumulated earning for Elite Booster, right? Uh, pending earning for for this month, right? It will keep in increasing until you, at the end of the month it will be pay off, right? If we uh, reset to zero and start recurring again for next month, and then we also add a few other uh, UI changes so that you can see more kind of statistics, right, about uh, What's going on in the Edge Cloud? I saw a few users ask about uh, T drop use cases. So that's actually what we saw on Twitter too that we wanted to address. Um, if you hadn't seen, we're excited to see that that Open Theta is integrating T drop soon. They in their last white paper that they released a few weeks ago, they're adding it as an incentive. Um, basically, if you you have T drop then you can stake it alongside their own native token they're creating. Um, and that gives you voting rights on how open data operates for various things. And also I think access to certain drops as well. So um, that's really exciting. We're talking to some other platforms as well to uh, have T-Drop almost serve like a, the liquidity mining or incentive token for uh, any type of exchange platform. It doesn't just have to be data drop, uh, the platform data drop. And so um, that's something that I've been working on and talking to several platforms about basically allocating T-Drop and giving that same flywheel to encourage users to, to, to trade or to use their platform, whatever it is with the use case for different platforms. But a yeah, long way of saying we are working on expanding use cases for T-Drop for sure. Yeah, uh, I still saw this question. Does the, the edge, uh, Elite Booster reward, right? Goes, goes back to the original a staking wallet or it is uh, to the uh, Elite Edge node itself. So I think the, our current design is that uh, the reward will go back to the wallet you stake your TFU from, right? You, you stake your TFU and lock your TFU from the staking wallet, then you will receive a reward uh, in, that, in that wallet. A related question, how much TFU do you need to stake? Uh, again, just, just trying to be really clear, right? To participate in the Elite Booster, you have to stake the full 500,000 TFL uh, to your Elite. Uh, and then you can stake, in a, you can lock an additional 500,000 beyond that for a total of one, uh, one million.
Right? Right. Shall we go back? Yeah, should we go back to some of the questions submitted uh, beforehand? Yeah, yeah, and we can jump back as well, give some time if we have uh, extra time to jump back in the user questions. Um, but a few others I pulled out. Um, well, since we're just talking about TJRP, so someone asked, uh, so some TNT20 tokens are starting to get on centralized exchanges, but native TNT20 TDRAP is stuck on decentralized exchanges only that require some expert knowledge to provide. So that is true that DEXs tend to be a little more complicated if you're not uh, a big crypto user. Pretty easy once you try it a few times, but still, yeah, that could be a learning curve versus a centralized exchange. TDRAP is actually on Gate and Bitthumb. Um, Get them only for Korean users, but gate accessible pretty much anywhere. Might possibly not the U.S. Um, but uh, and we are, we are talking to other exchanges about uh, TNT twenty access as well. You may have noticed if you listed on other centralized exchanges like Vexi recently, that always makes it very easy to list additional TNT twenty tokens because then there's no technical integration really. It's just um, it's a pretty quick leap. Uh, from there, so that's great. Every time you see a TNT twenty token um, on a new centralized exchange, it means it's much easier for more to come after that. So that's great to see. Um, we are also working on some upgrades for Theta Swap to improve liquidity. Basically, on the back end, some of the code is based on now that there's been more innovation in how liquidity providers can provide to automated market maker DEXs like like Theta Swap or Uniswap, or many you're probably familiar with. Um, we can do more to make it, uh, for a given amount of liquidity, it will provide a uh, given amount of assets in the liquidity pool, provide more liquidity and less slippage for any, any amount of trade. So really improve the user experience and, um, and, and <coughs> your trade execution. So that's going to help on the DEX side, but on the, if you want to stick to centralized exchanges, those are going to be getting better and better now that you see more TT20 tokens come in there. Good. I think we'll have another question data drop again it's related to the june 26 booster after the initial find a thousand t feel can you stake in ten thousand t feel steps or increments or are there different rules and so the short answer to that and jay you can correct me if i'm wrong there's there's no uh, minimum required so you can stake an additional one t feel if you wanted to uh and lock that up for three six or twelve months or you can you know you can lock an additional five so anywhere between one to five hundred thousand uh, yeah, TFU. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and then the locking will be managed by a smart contract, right? So you're not sending the tissue to us, but uh, it will be on chain, so everything. Correct. So there will be yeah. a smart contract on chain yeah. that you can um, you can monitor at any point in time. And the smart contract itself will enforce the, the locking mechanism. So when it becomes unlocked, then just like um, <clears throat> other forms of staking, there is a cool down period, uh, which depends. It's a certain number of blocks, um, but probably within a few days. Yeah. Oh, so uh, I saw the next one is a technical question. Uh, is there an optimal NVIDIA driver, right? Uh, and does it even matter? So uh, for that, I think the, the simple answer is that we're always trying to install, we always uh, recommend to install the latest version of the drivers, right? And then, uh, and then with a CUDA enable, right? So that will prepare the machine for, for us to run those uh, uh, drops that will poten potentially need to utilize the, the GPU processing power. Oh, that's good. Uh, next question. So, uh, can the team tell more about the spec, right, of the edge node? How about, for example, how uh, the GPU, the RAM size, you know, uh, the hard drive space for edge node, for example? Yeah, I think so. As I alluded to earlier, so uh, community node will be our focus for phase three, right? Which which will come hopefully in a few months, right? Uh, later in the year or uh, coming into next year. So uh, by by then, as we get closer, we will release the um, the exact spec right uh, on our main page, our documentation page, then and then you can uh, you know get the exact spec from from there. We get closer. Okay. So perfect, and then of course there is um, you know. Um, um, GPU, high-end GPU levels, which are, you know, typically data center, you know, type of GPUs that uh, you can certainly, all right, I, I, I know that you can outright purchase a, a rig or build your own with a A100 uh, or um, uh, uh, B100 or something like that. Uh, so that's certainly possible. And that, all that, of course, um, 
becomes uh, part of the network, right? And we'll recognize that as that having much more, much more processing power, right? Than, than the, um, than uh, even a GPU, a 4090 GPU. Although we do see the 4090s, the 4080s and 4090s as being very, very capable from an inference AI inference standpoint, being able to serve uh, these models, uh, particularly the um, uh, text to image, um, you know, um, you know, certain chatbots uh, and uh, and certain other types of uh, of models, uh, and, and of course, as as again, we as we continue to develop the technology, going back again to the pipeline uh, AI pipeline is that potentially some parts of the pipeline could be um, in a hybrid mode, right? Let's say that if you have uh, you know, one model which is highly, um, you know, highly GPU intensive, such as let's say 2.5 to 3D, that can be done within the cloud environment. Whereas, you know, the initial step of generating that uh, that text to 2.5D, that could be done through uh, an edge node. So that's kind of our vision, right? So there's this very hybrid model where it's constantly optimizing price to performance, right? And that's how uh, our vision eventually will, will you know, will be a uh, will. Um, I'll compete, right? Um, and, uh, and 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 customers will uh, will see that. Um, <clears throat> maybe we can take some uh, some more uh, more community questions. Uh, I think um, unless there's some more from Twitter. Yeah, uh, uh, just one quick one. We did pass, but pretty important. Um, a user asked on Twitter that the status of Ledger. Um, just in case anyone missed it. Uh, check our tweet from, I believe it's April 17, around that time. But short answer is that uh, we're working directly with Ledger team. This issue is about that uh, data uses blind signing for the Ledger integration. And they announced a few months back, Ledger did, that they're phasing that out in June of this year. So um, we've been talking to their team directly for months and working on a solution. Turns out, in the end, they will not actually phase out blind signing immediately in June. So it's not going to change anything how you access uh, on the Theta web wallet with a ledger for now. And um, we're collaborating with them on a, 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 a new version entirely that's going to make it uh, a better user experience. And, and we're hoping to have that out in the fall. But they assured us that uh, there won't be any time where Theta users lose access to Theta assets on the ledger. So we they, they have it under control. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Another community question on Theta Drop. Oh, someone's asking whether these are my spelling bee uh, awards that I got, uh, you know, up on the wall here. <laughs> I wish, you know, when I was back in school, I was sucked pretty bad in spelling. So, um, no, those 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 are actually uh, our patents. I, right. I don't know yeah. if, if you guys can see that, um, but uh, yeah, I think it kind of kind of spans beyond this edge over here. So we still have. Right. Uh, another three three more walls around yeah. us that yeah. we can As uh... we continue. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we can fill this conference room right with patterns. So so For we don't sure. need a painter or something. We don't need to decorate our room. So there we <laughs> go. Just with all the patterns. There we go. Yeah. Um, again, like 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 we've always said in the past, you know, these patterns are just very strategic for us from the standpoint of. Uh, of working and you know collaborating with some of these strategic uh, partners, um, it really underlies a lot of the technical capabilities. Right, it's almost like a checkbox. Oh, you guys know what you're talking about from a technical standpoint, um, and then you have uh, the protection right uh, in um, in in developing something that's uh, that's unique. And also related to that, uh, Jaya, today you tweeted about. A very technical white paper, which was submitted and and uh, right, it was it got accepted, accepted by a, a top tier conference. I, I emphasize that uh, the conference is a uh, kind of premier forum, right, for the researcher for uh, future direction of the World Wide Web, right. Uh, so you know, historically, there's a lot of a very important research finding was, was published uh, on this conference. In particular, the uh, the page rank algorithm, which by uh, Larry Page and uh, Sergey Brin, the Google founders, right. So uh, they originally published their paper on on this pay, uh, on this conference back in 1999, right? So it's like uh, 25 years ago, uh, right? Which lays down the foundation for um, 
for uh, Google search engine, right? So yeah, so we are pretty honored to be able to get accepted into this conference. I think uh, you know a one of students in Professor Xiao's lab is actually currently in Singapore, right, attending this conference and doing present presentation there. So as we continue, then we will uh, you know uh, push a bound, continue to push a boundary. Uh, in AI, in Web3, in blockchain, right? And then do even deeper research, right? To build, uh, you know, our, you know, our, our core uh, technology, uh, our you know, tech stack here. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important for us from our R&D perspective. But as you guys have probably already seen, you know, we, you know, we've always sort of come from um, the, the industry and we're really, uh, really, really good at uh, taking these uh, very forward facing um, R&D projects and uh, bringing them to market. Um, and you know, putting a go-to-market plan in place. So they, that's what uh, our plan continues. Yeah, so this uh, three, uh, Sketchless 3D is an example, right? So yeah, to my knowledge, it's, it's probably the, the first uh, this such kind of uh, demo or uh, you know, showcase in the world. So I, I haven't seen similar things elsewhere from the sketch to uh, the 3D. Yeah, and, and hopefully we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that up on the AI showcase uh, yeah. next uh, next few weeks, and then uh, you guys can all play with that as well. So very, uh, very exciting. Yep. Yeah, we have uh, <clears throat> a question regarding um, whether we're able to integrate this into mid-journey or is it just stable diffusion? Um, well, as you guys might know, um, stable diffusion is open source and that's where we're able to not just take the base a a stable diffusion model, but they have many different versions, what's called checkpoints. Our snapshots to stable diffusion, we're able to incorporate that into the Edge Cloud. Mid-journey is a proprietary model. Um, so they control everything. They, they run it on, on their end uh, and um, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever prompts or whatever it is you submit, they, that, that goes to their servers, right? Um, so um, the short answer is that they're not open source. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're not a potential, uh, potential partner. Yeah, and also uh, the open source community is really active, right? They're uh, constantly doing research and then doing, you know, fine tuning of the model so that uh, to improve the generation result, right? So maybe, you know, as time goes by, the gap between those uh, open source model and closed model will be narrower, right? It will shrink at some point that uh, maybe the quality generated by our uh, showcase uh, by our Edge Cloud platform will be able to catch up and then, you know, on par with whatever generated by uh, Midjourney or Imagine, you know, as close source of the world. Wes, who's your favorite guitarist? I'll just answer that quickly. Uh, um, Probably for nostalgia reasons, Kirk Hammett growing up. That's kind of where I first, first learned a few uh, riffs and licks. So got to go with that. <laughs> Another question, uh, any new sub chains coming, coming up? You know, they'd be utilizing the Edge Cloud. Um, and I think that's, that's a really great question. I, I think the community um, and, you know, being the bull market that we are in, sometimes we lose sight of that. But if you zoom out, you always, you know, see the pattern. That's what I do. So I don't have to be looking at the charts, you know, every hour, every day. But if you look at every few weeks, um, you'll see that uh, I think it was improving a little bit this morning. I haven't looked uh, today, uh, I think. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the point is that, you know, with, with our community and going to the bull market, uh, always uh, partners uh, that are developing and looking to launch additional subchains. We're really excited about that. And we're also seeing not just subchains within the media, entertainment, gaming space, uh, but in various other verticals, uh, which hasn't been um, announced yet. Um, in all cases, Edge Cloud is a big part of that equation. I think that's one of the things that really uh, separates and differentiates us from other, um, you know, uh, layer one chains out there is the fact that um, not only do you have the, the building blocks and infrastructure to build your own um, token and your crypto uh, ecosystem, uh, but also uh, the uh, utility part, right? Being able to utilize our Edge Cloud and utilize our 
uh, video infrastructure and our AI infrastructure, rendering infrastructure for uh, their business. Uh, and I think that's where um, really becomes a, a really strong win-win uh, for, uh, for us. You guys rock, yeah. Love you guys too. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we definitely need to do this AMA. It's been too long. I know the last one we did was at DataCon, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll do this a little bit a uh, little bit more often. Um, although there is um, just a reminder, there is a DataCon Europe uh, coming up in Prague, which I will be there in June. So so for those of you those of you that on the fence, you know, come on out. Let's uh, let's grab a drink. Uh, let's talk. Uh, and of course, I'll be at uh, in Vegas at the end of the year uh, as well. Um, and probably with uh, most of the team, right? Because it's, it's really just around the corner for us. Looking forward to meeting you guys there. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who uh, uh, attended the concert before, if you don't know Resorts World, this is an amazing venue in Vegas. It's the newest casino on the Strip and, and probably the best one. Um, so, yeah, get your tickets. It's going to be definitely the best Datacon yet. <laughs> Oh, that's a question. Well, Jay, you make it to the first data con in person. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. going to be a surprise, huh? You're going to parachute in uh, one of these times? <laughs> wow, wow. I wish I could. Yeah, I'll, I'll try, try to see, you know, uh, if I can make it this, this, this time. Uh, you know, really looking forward to see, you know, the, you know, the community in person, right? Uh, discussing what's the next step, you know, uh, what you can build on Edge Cloud and all that. Perfect. Je will definitely have four bodyguards around them because without Je, we, uh, we wouldn't have much, <laughs> <laughs> much here. <laughs> See, uh, does it feel talk replay? Um, yeah, they've. Uh, I hope I'm not spoiling something that uh, they haven't quite tipped off. But I think in only a few weeks they're going to start launching their first uh, AI tools that are going to be using Edge Cloud. So big stuff coming there for for more jobs for uh, Edge Cloud, and we're really excited to for them to start using the network more. T fuel as rare as GPUs. Well, I mean, <laughs> depending on relative to the supply, it's possible T fuel is in even, even more demand. I don't know. It, it all depends on how many people uh, uh, need to use Edge Cloud and have to pay Edge node providers. So, yeah, it's all about adding more on the demand side and get building out these these awesome tooling that that JE and Co make because that's going to increase demand for the network and. and Drive demand for, for the native token. Yeah, for sure. The utilization, the usage of our platform, right? For those partners and customers that want to be paying <clears throat> Edge Cloud with TFL. Um, you know, as I mentioned also at the beginning of the MA, you know, it's just really amazing to see our elite node surpassing 10,000. Um, at any given time, I think we're around 12,000 active nodes. And then in aggregate, over a course of a month, we're seeing somewhere now approaching 30,000 edge nodes, which are on and off, right? So those are unique nodes over the course of a month. And those are really major milestones for us. Uh, very exciting. The fact that the amount of TFL staked and locked is approaching 40%. Um, as that number, which I'm sure will continue to, to go up um, uh, over the next few months as we approach 50, 60%. Uh, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, however you look at that, it becomes a little bit more rare for our customer partners to then be, have to acquire that in the open market uh, to pay for the product and our services. Um, so, you know, on, on that part, of course, um, you know, we're going to have to, you know, look at the pricing of our services relative to, um, and, you know, eventually we do want to price, have a pricing model where it's much more advantageous, much more beneficial for a customer to pay in TFL over a fiat currency. In fact, we would love nothing but to have our uh, uh, fiat or U.S. dollar, you know, Stripe, you know, driving zero percent of all, of all the, uh, of all the sales. We want everything to be flowing through TFL. So we're going to give uh, a benefit for customers to, uh, uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah. So also, I would like to also challenge our uh, developers in our community, right, to, to build your application on top of uh, Edge Cloud. So if your 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 application gets popular and attract users, then inevitably that you'll be you need more GPUs, right? In, in Edge Cloud, they will drive the payment, uh, especially drive the payment in TFU, right? So this will increase the utility of TFU, right? So this will be, will make uh, TFU become even more rare. So. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, there's a, a couple of questions uh, <clears throat> around uh, Ether, our partner Ether that we announced, as you know, um, some of you may have read Kyle Okamoto uh, is an advisor to us uh, for, for many years now, and he's a, um, an executive over at Aether. Uh, they're doing some really fantastic things. Uh, our first uh, uh, partnership uh, really involves, you know, gaining access to Ether's uh, infrastructure, which includes a number of GPUs, uh, GPU farm. Um, and, you know, what, one of the key things that I kind of want to stress is that our vision here at Data is not necessarily to go into the hardware or the data center side of the uh, of the business. That is just, uh, I think, uh, too risky. Um, your know, hardware has way too many uh, variables that you have to account for, uh, in including uh, very large startup costs, uh, and then um, not being able to scale that up and down in um, in changing uh, environments and economies. It's very risky. So we'll never necessarily get into the hardware side of things. However. With partners like Aether, we can have access to um, a, a large supply, right, of GPUs across different regions. So that's one of the things that uh, is very challenging for us is optimizing for not only where the customers are, but also for where their users are uh, globally, so that we have the best experience. So we're always looking for um, redundancy as well as 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 uh, as, as uh, being able to uh, adapt to. Uh, to peak uh, peak usage is you know again when you have instances are, which are reserved um, all the time it's very expensive because they're always on so you are essentially paying for them and yet when you do have an AMA something like this right or when you do have a large scale campaign or whatnot and you can draw 10 or 100x your usual uh, number of users you have to be able to to account for that and that's again a big part of the uh, equation that we're trying to solve for in our price to performance ratio. Um, uh, again, this is something we don't talk about nearly as much is the fact that when you have a decentralized network and we're able to bring that into different parts of the model pipeline and, and into a particular um, into a particular jobs that we're able to amortize, we'll be able to leverage the distributed nodes um, and be able to then build for that peak uh, those that peak usage. So I have uh, it's another question on um, the Elite Booster. What's your estimation for CPU GPU usage? Um, the white paper says 80 to 100%. I believe the white paper or the FAQ or a combination of both uh, says uh, it's very important. That is a word if, right? If the um, GPUs are utilized 80 to 100%, then, um, then you should be able to see uh, the APY uh, approaching anywhere between um, 14 to 28 percent or uh, something in that range. Um, again, that depends on a number of different factors, a number of different variables. We'll be launching with some initial partners uh, as well as powering our own AI showcase. As you guys know, we've just had an incredible amount of activity. Uh, I don't know if JE you know, can share any specific stats, but yeah. you know, all of our instances which are allocated to uh, the AI showcase, particularly the text image, right? The stable right, diffusion right, yep. is almost 100% utilized at all times, 24/7, uh, and it's really incredible. Um, you know, I, I think we we looked at a uh, network map of where the active nodes are at any given point, and there's just there's just these big blue blobs, you know, blinking all over the all over the world, and primarily concentrated in North uh, North North America. Um, you know, U Europe, UK, Australia, uh, some parts of Asia. Um, but it's 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 really something. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, try try uh, to use our AI showcase, right? It will as the more you use it, then uh, the more utilization it is, right? And then potentially that uh, whoever you know. You don't want to tell people that. <laughs> Come on. Next thing you know, <laughs> the whole community is going to be using our showcase all the time, and then yeah. uh, the, and then all the uh, lead boosters are going to yeah. be. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not in the sense that uh, trying to crash our. Uh, <laughs> Uh, showcase but in the sense that uh, as you guys continue to use a showcase you might discover some kind of more depth uh, pattern right you can use it better so this is what i saw on twitter a lot of people are uh, showcasing their uh, image generating from the showcase tool right and some people discovered that hey if i tweet my uh, prompt a little bit then it may be able to generate much higher quality image and i also see uh, uh hints i think 
Uh, yes, it, our uh, partner. Our Hansen. partner. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, he, he, he just posted a YouTube video and 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 then teach user you know how how you can tune your prompt so that it can generate you know amazing results, right? So this is uh, something we want to see. Not just go there and blindly you know uh, typing a dog, a cat, a fish, something like that. But you know they look into it and then see that uh, what kind of parameter you can tune and then how how you can uh, improve the prompt right to generate amazing result, right? So. For sure. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a question around ash, uh, edge caching jobs, which is part of the uh, the edge node today. Um, so the edge caching and the caching functionality has now been folded into what was previously known as the Theta Video API, which is now part of Edge Cloud Video, right? So anyone using the, our video infrastructure, right, for uh, for live stream or VOD, right, as part of Edge Cloud Video now, um, if you implement the Theta um, the Theta uh, player, which has the the peer to peer, the caching then occurs between the peers, uh, and that will be folded into that. I think as part of the June twenty sixth launch, um, there'll be some UI cleanup there. I think the caching section uh, will be uh, will be removed. Uh, so I saw one uh, one one comment here. You guys should share it on Twitter, right? This two uh, D to three D uh, model demo. So yeah, I, yeah. I think that uh, we'll, 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 uh, there will be a couple of things we will we'll share. Uh, one is one blog post, right, which will document the um, you know what actually the technology behind the scene, right? What actually when you click all those buttons, so what model are being used, and then what computation are you know going on on the GPUs, right? We'll have that, and hopefully we'll have a recording of the demo session, so which we'll share. On Twitter, right? So that uh, you guys can can watch it if you're interested. It will post on YouTube, and uh, <clears throat> this this more technical blog that we're preparing, we'll 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 push that out tomorrow, hopefully. So yeah. we got a little bit of work after the CMA, right. yeah. but we'll kind of put everything uh, that we demoed today into uh, into a blog that can be easily shared. Um, and um, yeah, and hopefully uh, you all can uh, help uh, spread the word there. Yeah. Uh, but you know, what, once we get that. Uh, up and running on the AI uh, on the AI showcase. I think you guys can play with it yourselves, and then you know to send that, that link on to uh, you know to to friends, family, and industry folks. Any other questions you see there, uh, Wes, coming from uh, Twitter or anyone else, uh, anywhere else? That's a data relaying for a replay. So I think these jobs have already been uh, been being submitted to edge nodes. Actually, we just realized something the other day that um, those have been falling under the TVA umbrella. So because uh, they had asked why their nodes weren't showing up with their own jobs, we realized it wasn't being branded. So that's something we're, we're checking out. Um, but yeah, I think it's important because uh, it, we, we've talked about this a little bit, but you know, what our, our vision eventually is for Edge Node operators to be able to um, have more control over which jobs that they're doing, almost like a marketplace where you're being bid for the, your, your uh, service you're providing to the network. Um, and that's going to be especially important when you see uh, they may pay in T fuel, they may pay in uh, other TNT 20 tokens, you may want one or the other or not want to do certain jobs. So um, it'll be important to have transparency about what the jobs are that's coming to your node, and then you'll be able to um, pick and choose which you're you know, willing to provide your capacity to the network for. Uh, so I saw a few folks asking about the Edge Store, right? So yeah, I think that uh, yeah. So uh, we should put an update here, uh, as mentioned in our white paper, right? So uh, Edge Store in in the context of Edge Compute, uh, Edge Edge Cloud, would probably take a different shape or form compared to original the original KV Store, right? So for example, uh, when you run those uh, inference job for those uh, large models, and for example, stable diffusion and others, you have to download this model, which is a gigabyte size, right? Six, seven gigabytes, right? So they will, this will need to utilize some of the storage on you know, the user's computer, on a cloud computer. And then those will be accounted for in, in our final calculation about the reward, right? So you will get a, a piece of reward for uh, the compute, but also get a, a, a piece for the, the storage, right? So this is 
will be the um, kind of the new, new new format for the edge store. Correct. So this is part of the the last phase, the right. what we describe as a phase right. three, where we begin to integrate the edge network right into right. the overall architecture. So when you run your own node, um, it's hypothetically, say for instance, you know if you're running a text to video AI model because you have a forty ninety, or maybe you have something even more powerful than that. Um, turns out that these text to video AI models are extremely large. Uh, what would you say is the size of some of these models? Yeah, it could be six, seven gigabytes or even larger, right, in the future, uh, you know, depending right. on, right, so. Gigabytes, uh, yeah. and again, like with something like Stable Diffusion, I've, I've seen um, in uh, GitHub and open source uh, forums where there are many, many different versions of Stable Diffusion. I think there are at least dozens, if not hundreds, and hundreds of different checkpoints and variations. And so when all those are effectively stored locally, and when your edge node is then issued a job to, uh, to uh, you know, process, right, to serve uh, uh, as inference, right, for a, particular, uh, for a particular version of stable diffusion, it would then load up that stable diffusion on your local GPU, right, into memory, right, from disk. But the fact that, you know, those models have to be residing on disk uh, in, you know, uh, before that, right, a priori, so that you have uh, an efficient way of serving that up uh, on a real-time basis. And so if, if you are, if each of these stable diffusion is somewhere between five and 10 gigabytes, uh, you can imagine when you have a hundred variations of this, uh, and that's just, that's just text to image, right? And, and again, you know, Edge Cloud is an open platform where we're gonna be supporting um, all sorts of uh, different types of AI models, right? Um, as, as, uh, as we all seen, even real-time interactions now that's been announced by Everyone from OpenAI to Google, uh, you know, voice-to-voice, uh, -voice, text-to-voice, uh, you know, voice-to-text, you know, real-time, um, you know, all that becomes uh, a lot of data, um, and that's a really big part of um, our vision there. Hmm. Mitch, are you confident on data being one hundred dollars this bull run? <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Do you, uh, do I look like I'm uh, I'm confident? You know, we uh, we certainly don't uh, can't comment on price, but uh, hopefully uh, you can tell that uh, we are um, very excited about uh, where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I saw someone ask a question about. Um... If Theta Labs doesn't have any data left, what incentives they have to continue to keep building? But yeah, at, at the rate that that's going, that would be, I just did some back of the envelope math, and that would be at least 20 years, if not longer, from now. So I, I would say if we're in the year 2044 and data is not sustainable as a network without, um, you know, us as individuals or Theta Labs, then that's probably a bigger problem. But, you know, that's, Few decades down the road, so yeah. <laughs> and uh, the follow-on question about T drop not uh, being distributed for liquidity mining. Yeah, so we're aware that T drop is lagging behind. Um, originally, um, you know, is liquidity mining. You know, for anyone that essentially um, buys, um, the reward goes to the buyer or the seller. I'm, uh, uh, so, uh, so, so the, yeah, so the, the T drop, right? The T drop, yeah. Right, right. So. Uh, so in any case, I, 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 not, uh, I, I forgot whether this goes to the buyer or seller, but we're lagging behind in that distribution. And that goes back to Wes's earlier point of, um, of uh, really opening up that ecosystem. That's something that we are uh, excited and we're, we're, we're looking at. So essentially um, incorporating and utilizing T-Drop uh, for ecosystem projects and partner other marketplaces, other uh, uh, gaming platforms, et cetera, so that there is additional uh, additional utility. It also becomes sort of a way for us to uh, to allocate uh, sort of ecosystem funds or tokens, right, to to encourage building around uh, around data. There you go. Theta will be a thousand dollars. I mean, that's exactly why I didn't want to answer the earlier question because I knew it wasn't going to be a hundred. <laughs> It'll be on Theta Island by then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't know what the going rate on an island is, but I'm sure I'm sure it's in. The, if you add up the whole community, I'm sure it's in our price range. Yeah. <laughs> 
Terrific. I think we're coming up to 2.30 uh, or yeah, close to an hour and a half. I, I think we're pretty close to wrapping this up. I, I don't know if there's last, last minute questions. Yes, iOS devices. Uh, yes, that's that's also in our plans. A little bit trickier with Apple, as you know, Apple approves uh, every uh, every app uh, that goes uh, on their platform. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. Um, also, the the um, the tech stack on uh, iOS is a little bit more a uh, little bit more challenging, right. where uh, all the permissions and whatnot. So that's something that we are uh, continuing to look at. Yeah, but I, I think even the Android version that uh, would be a great re learning process, right? We will uh, be able to amass a lot of data points from there and see that whether we can port those uh, technology to iOS, right? Or do something and hopefully eventually be able to distribute it to, uh, you know, billions of devices, right, in the future. Are we going to make it to top 10 ranking this bull run? Why would we even think about top 10? Why not just ahead of Ethereum will be, uh, will be good. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Should we uh, should we wrap it up, uh, Wes? I think it's been uh, it's been great. Yeah, this is good. Always good to spend time with the community and talk with you guys directly. Um, hopefully, we've been seeing a bunch of you guys in in June in Prague, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to do this again soon. Yeah, if you haven't, uh, if you're anywhere nearby and uh, anywhere near Europe, yeah, come on by in June uh, and or uh, and or Vegas. All right, guys. Okay, okay we'll wrap it up. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. It's been great. Yeah. Thank yeah, you all. Okay. Bye. Bye.